Okay, so welcome to uh, this live Q&A session. Um, we are also live on YouTube and uh, it's a Q&A session. So we're gonna just take some questions you have, things that you would want me to share my thoughts on. Uh, for those of you joining us on YouTube, you can put it in the comments uh, or in the chat for me and I'm gonna be giving you a reply. Those of you with us on Zoom here, you raise your hand and we bring you up or you can also put it in the chat on Zoom. And it's a QA, and a uh, and we have a lot of people. So your question has to be specific not a whole topic. This is not where, where we are coming to teach a whole topic. So you make sure that your question is specific to something that you have challenge with that you would want me to uh, share my thought on. And uh, we will be able to provide you with some assistance on that particular case. So uh, welcome. If there are any questions, you raise your hand, we bring you up and uh, or you put it in the chat for me. If there is any specific thing that you have that you want me to share my thought on as I'll be providing you as well with some other strategies and few things that you need to know about. Like I mentioned, it should be specific. Come and give us a whole book to come and read. We don't have time to read book. Okay, um, YouTube said my sound is not on, really. Is my sound not on? That's from Nyami Kofi Jr. No sound though, is it true? Is that true? Okay, yeah, my sound is on. Very crispy like that. Yes. Um, no more. Timothy, your hand is up. What you got? Hey, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Um, please, my channel has to do with um, convertible loan notes, the calculation. That's convertible loan notes, the calculation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you say the calculation, yeah. what do you mean? Like if um, the issue is uh, you know the loan note that is convertible, how to split it? Okay. Like the whole working, you see, in in terms of a uh, single HTC question footnote. Uh, like okay. the question is. Uh, All right. So when it comes to convertible loan notes, what we do is to uh. Number one, find out the issue relating to the debt component. Anytime there is convertible loan notes, it means that uh, we are going to, be, and we are dealing with a company that issued the convertible loan notes. The standard requires IAS 32, IFRS 9, requires that we split the convertible loan notes into the debt component and the equity component. Now, how do you get a debt component? You get a debt component by converting the cash flows on the loan notes. So you're gonna use the coupon rate. Whatever amount the coupon rate is, you apply it on the nominal value of the loan notes. Then you get a various interest rate over the years of the loan notes. Then at the, on the date of redemption, the last one to what cash flow is gonna come in, you multiply. Then you calculate the present value. Once you calculate the present value, that becomes the debt component. So you subtract that from the total proceeds we had from the issue of the loan notes. The balancing figure becomes the equity component. So that is the initial measurement. That's how you split the uh, loan notes into the debt component and the equity component. If there is any transaction cost that the entity incurred in the issuing of the loan notes, what we do is that the transaction cost to be shared between the debt and the equity using the value obtained by uh, from the very first step, which is the debt and the equity. Once you have that on subsequent measurements, the debt is a financial liability. So it will be carried using the amortized cost schedule with any finance cost computed for the period or for the year recognized in the profit or loss accounts. Then the carrying amounts of the liability will be recognized on the face of the statement of financial position. The equity component on the face of the statement of financial position is recognized under equity as other components of equity and that's all until the date of redemption before we can determine the faith of the equity. So when it comes to convertible loan notes, this is how we structure it out or that is what we do about 
long note. Does that make sense for you now, Timothy? Let me know. Um, yes, but I can pronounce an ambassador. You can what? It's okay, but I can use some, you know, some figures and then make it more. So let me see if I can bring my uh, screen on in a moment. Just let you understand what's happening. Hey, I have an audio playing on the background. Like that. Okay, so this is what I mean. So we have a convertible loan note. See, we have a 6% convertible loan note of $10,000. And when we issued it, it was issued at par. That means still it was issued at $10,000. No problem on that. And it's convertible loan notes. So how do we get the debt component and uh, how do we get the equity component? So this is what we are saying. Now, 6% of this amount, what will we have? 0 0.06 by 10,000, that's 600. So what we are saying here is that, and it's redeemable in let's say five years at 10% premium. Let's just do that. So I will have years, I will have um, cash flow, we'll have discount factor, we'll have present value. Now, this is the 6% is the coupon rate. Then, oh, give me a moment. I think my slide is delaying because of this. Give me a moment, let me check this. So let me bring back my screen. It was delaying because I was on a different. Let's see if I can get a better connection now coming up. Good. Ooh, unable to come up. Oh, I don't know. My screen doesn't want to come. I'm coming. Okay. Let me bring back my screen. If there are any questions you have, you can put it in the chat for me, or you raise your hand, we bring you up. And please ensure it's a specific question so that we don't spend enough time on it we have a lot of questions already coming up so let's say this is the pro forma we had it's redeemable in five years time let's say uh, the effective rate that is interest rate on similar bond without conversion right let's say that is going to be um eight percent let's say that is going to be eight percent so in that case, from year one to year five, we'll receive an interest of 600. Then in the fifth year, we are going to be receiving an interest of, now you can do for each year or use the annuity and go away. Then in the first, in the fifth year, it will be redeemed at a premium of 10%. So that means it will be redeemed at uh, 11,000. So you bring in the discount factor. Let's see if we can trust this up, FM. Just want to read a discount factor. I don't have time to calculate. So annuity factor, we are using 8% for five years. So 8% five years is 3.9993. Then present value, 8% for the fifth year, 0.6. 8.1. So we multiply up respectively 600 by 3.993. Ooh, I get 2, 3, 9, 6 approximately. 
11,000 times 0.8, uh, something like 7, 4, 9, 2. Uh, let's see. If it doesn't work, I'll increase the process. Don't worry. 7, 4, 9, 2, plus 2, 3, 9, 6. Okay, so I'm getting 9888. So assuming this is the scenario, let's just stay with it like that. So the loan notes was issued at 8 par, which is 10,000. Coupon rate is 6%. Effective rate is 8%. It is redeemable in five years time. So this present value here is what we are talking about as the debt component. So this is the debt component. So that when we subtract the 10,000 from it, it becomes the equity component. So 10,000 minus 88, eight, sorry, 9888, eight, eight, eight. that's 112. That becomes the equity component, the balancing figure. This is what we are talking about. That's how you split it into debt and equity. If there was transaction price or transaction cost of say 500, we will share that transaction cost between debt component, equity component, total. So from the proceeds here, you had 9888112, giving us a total of 10,000. So transaction cost 500, you're going to share it between these two guys. So 112 divided by 10,000 times 500. And that gives you an amount of, let's say six, yeah? So that this will be four, four, sorry, 494. You subtract. So if there was a transaction cost, that's how you deal with it. And that gives you the initial measurement. And this will be 95. This will be 106. Then 9888 minus 494. This will be 9394. So that is the initial measurement in that case. If there is a transaction cost, that's what you do. Now on subsequent measurement, you prepare your amortized cost schedule. Having your balance brought forward, having your interest, having your payment, having your carry forward in that case. So in the first year, in the first year, your balance is 9394. You bring in the effective rate of 8%. Your coupon rate is 6 and then you get your answer. And that's how you deal with it. The interest to be calculated here will go to the PL account. Then the carrying figure or carry down here will go to the statement of financial position. This is what we are talking about in relation to convertible loan notes. Thank you, sir. I'm grateful. Right. So that is it about that. Let's see. I'm getting a couple of other. Things coming in. Oh, okay. So you were punching. My challenge is calculating PE ratio in business valuation. Calculating PE ratio. PE ratio is simply the share price over earnings per share. So when you say your challenge is calculating it in PE ratio, what exactly do you mean by that? Give me a mom moment. I don't know why my screen is sort of lagging let me see if i can pick it up my screen is still lagging okay so rose when you say calculating the p ratio uh because p ratio is the share price divided by earnings per share and if you are doing p ratio that means the proxies information will be given to you. The other company information will be given to you. So you use their share price, which will be given to you. Then you have to calculate the earnings per share of the company. So share price of the company will always be given to you. Then maybe that proxy firm, we have to calculate their earnings per share. And earnings per share is simply parties that is profit attributable to equity shareholders divided by the number of shares. And that information will also be provided to us in the question for the proxy firm so that we know exactly what we can do in that case. So let me know, is it, uh, let me know the context of what, where the challenge is. 
Is it that when the proxy information is given, you are not able to do the calculation or what exactly? Maybe give me some context on what the issue. Okay, I think she's even off. Okay. Using the proxy okay. information, using the using the proxy information to get the to get the answer to the question where you have to you either have to increase the the percentage or you decrease the percentage. That's where my challenge is. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So let's see. Now, in the in that particular case, as you have mentioned, let's see if I can bring back my slide. I'll bring back my screen on that. Okay, so like I mentioned, the proxies information is going to be provided to us uh, in the question in that particular case. Now, so the proxy data will be given to us. We'll be giving it at their share price. Let's say that we are giving their share price of whatever amount, $4 per share. Then we are giving their number of shares. Let's say they have 10,000 shares. Then we are giving their parties, that is profit attributable to equity shareholders. Let's say they made a profit of whatever, um, 25,000 in that particular case. So that we are going to then calculate their earnings per share. And that is going to be the 25,000 over the 10,000 shares that they have. So 25,000 divided by 10,000, that's $2.5 so that my P ratio price earnings will be the share price divided by earnings per share. So that becomes $4 divided by $2.5. So if we work this out, $4 divided by 2.5, that is 1.6. So that is their P ratio, 1.6. Now, if the P ratio is 1.6 like this, we have to then compare this to the company whose shares we are valuing to determine whether we need to increase the value or reduce the value. So it all depends on the context of the question. Now, usually, how do we determine whether we have to use the same PE ratio or not? Now, usually, when it comes to the PE ratio, we cannot use the 1.6 in its raw state. Why? Because listed companies may have higher earnings than unlisted company. Listed companies will have lesser risk. So the risk profile of listed company will be pretty lower than unlisted company. They may have all other things being, being equal. They may have a higher profit than unlisted company. And then they may also have a lot of access to capital than the unlisted company. So in deciding what you do, it sometimes is going to be depending on the context of the companies whose shares we are valuing to determine how we can adjust for the 1.6. But like we said, usually your adjustment can be between 10 to what? 30% threshold. And it always have to be a reduction to the earnings per share, sorry, to the PE ratio, because definitely the listed company will have better risk profile, better profitability, better uh, capital structure than the companies whose shares we are valuing. So what we do is that you can look at the share, um, the capital structure of the proxy firm, compare that to the capital structure of the firm that we are valuing. Then you determine, okay, what, how, what margin of reduction must I take? Then you can decide to take 70%, 80%, of this PE ratio, and that would then become what you would use to value the company. So the decision rule has to do with comparing the capital structure of the proxy firm with the firm that we are valuing, taking into consideration risks, profitability, and the capital structure of the company. If we have information of some of these things available in the question, then you can reach a, a, a conclusive uh, rationale and say, Maybe I'm going to use 30% discount or 20% discount or 10% uh, discount. And that is always going to be discretional. That is always going to be discretional because while somebody will use 20% discount, someone will use 30% discount. So that is going to be discretional. 
But the key thing is you compare the capital structure of the proxy with the firms whose shares we are valuing. Then that becomes the basis for the decision rule as to whether to increase, uh, whether to reduce and by how or what margin are you going to be doing the reduction? Uh, Rose, let me know if that makes sense for you in that case. Then, she on the call, something like that. Then I'm seeing some questions coming in. Also, here. All right, that's fine. I'm seeing some questions coming in here on YouTube. Let's see if I can pick some one or two, then we come back here. Senior man, good evening. Please kindly explain the OECD principles of uh, corporate governance. Victor Boydi, do you sell your own books and where can I get them? You can call or you can send a, a message on WhatsApp. 050-114-9296. And you'll be directed on how to make payment and get a delivery of the book. Inshira, I wish to write the ICAC exam, but I am a bit afraid though. If you're afraid, you can't become a chartered accountant. So you have two options. Either you start writing or stop forever. Tara Ofori said, good evening, sir. Per the precinct of SES, sorry, SES, what are the likely modules we should expect in the analysis of the question? Couple of issues you need to understand about that. There is SWOT analysis is uh, fundamental there. So you have to prepare a SWOT analysis that is crucial because you need to identify the challenges that a company is faced with, the weaknesses and the threats of the company. SWOT analysis is critical. There is Porter's five forces in there. Uh, if you read a question well, you will know the bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of customers, uh, competitive rivalry, and then also the issue relating to threats from new entrants. So Porter's five forces, is going to be there. There is issue relating to the unsolved metrics. Uh, there is issues relating to corporate parenting style. There is issues relating to um, whatever, I think BCG model and uh, various other issues. But primarily, your SWOT analysis is going to be critical. Uh, your Porter's Fire Force is very basic. And then also the issue relating to governance, because remember, the examiner is definitely going to be bringing a question on governance that you need to be aware of. So there is going to be something in the exam hall on governance that you have to know about when it comes to dealing with that particular issue there. So these are the things that you can understand or you must understand in terms of the modules. I want to uh, bring you up with uh, the OECD principle that somebody asked about quickly and then just touch on them. Let me see if I can get a slide on that as soon as possible. If there are any questions, you raise your hand, we bring you up or you drop it in the chat uh, for me in that case. So this is corporate governance. And um, let's see if I have my OECD principles here and I can run them down with you here yeah. this is the combined code uh this is the role of the board you need to, no no it shouldn't be that far corporate governance principle most corporate governance principles are founded on that da, 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 da. okay yeah this is the oecd principle so let me go through them with you quickly in that case as your question is uh, so according to, to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, these are principles that we must understand under corporate governance. Number one is right, the rights to shareholders, the right to shareholders. So shareholders to have the, should have the right to participate and vote in general meetings. That's very critical. And they must be provided with all the information necessary to enable them to make sound decisions for the organization, because they are the people who contributed to the capital of the company, but most importantly, they are the people who also appointed the board of directors managing the company on their behalf. So they have a right 
to be receiving relevant and uh, material information on a timely basis that enables them to make various decisions that relates to their uh, investments. But then a company doesn't run by itself. So there are also other, you know, stakeholders that we need to know about. However, shareholders are of different types or different classes. OECD principle mentioned that number two, there has to be equitable treatment of shareholders. Because remember, we have minority shareholders, we have majority shareholders, we have preference shareholders, we have ordinary shareholders. Irrespective of the type of shareholder in question, it is important that we treat all of them equally based on their class, based on their decision making. Yes, preference shareholders cannot make decision about the day-to-day -day running of the organization. They don't have voting rights because they are creditors. However, decisions that relates to them they must be allowed to make those decisions because it's going to be affecting them. Also, it is important that the company is run bearing in mind the interest of other stakeholders because, like I said, the company is not on its own. We don't own responsibility only to shareholders. We have responsibility towards the employees of the organization. We have responsibility to the community at large. We have responsibility to the government as well as an organization. So it is important that a company is run in the interest of all the key stakeholders of the company. In other words, what we are saying here is that whatever decision that a company is making, we must make sure we are making it in the interest of the majority of the stakeholders of the organization. And when we do that, all other things being equal as a company, we will be able to maximize our interest and also achieve our objective. Disclosure and transparency. It is important that we are transparent and we disclose all information necessary to key stakeholders to be able to make the decision that they have to make in order to assist them in whatever they have to do. So we cannot conceal information. All material information must be made available to key stakeholders. Remember, disclosure does not mean that we will reveal our strategies because there are certain information, we cannot put it in the public. We cannot share it with others. It has to be something that will be uh, used internally that's something that will be used by management because when we disclose, our competitors may copy that and that will affect our corporate uh, sustainable or that will affect us achieving our competitive advantage. So even though there is disclosure and transparency, there is a limit to how much disclosure, how much transparency that we can give because of certain factors that must be taken into consideration. Nonetheless, all material matters regarding the company must undoubtedly be provided to the key stakeholders, the shareholders, so they can make sound decisions. And certainly, the responsibilities of the board. It is important that the board provides the strategic guidance for the entire company and they monitor the uh, activities of the organization because this is how the structure actually work. There is shareholders there. Then we have the board. Then we have the management team. Then we can have the various other departments within the organization. So shareholders appoint the board and the board monitors and controls the, uh, monitors the activities of the management team in the interest of the shareholders. So it is important that the board is diversified. The board has balanced uh, skills and portfolio. The board has a lot of non-executive uh, directors. Very important. The board is made up of nets, non-executive directors. Most importantly, then the management team will be made up of executive directors. Usually, either the CEO or the CFO of the company, one of them or the two, will be the only executive directors on the board. Some companies, only the CEO is a member of the board. The reason is that we want some independence. We want some monitoring. These are the principles, the OECD principles, when it comes to dealing with corporate governance and companies must, you know, be run in line with that. Companies must be run in line with that. Then, uh, so that is it about that. And that question was from, uh, I don't know, senior man, 
Sir, please, what is the annuity formula? Annuity formula, you expect me to have that in my head. Let me go to the annuity table and show you. <laughs> so this is the annuity formula. This one. This is it. This is the annuity formula. Timothy. That's the annuity formula. So you substitute the various figures to it and uh, into it. The N is the number of periods in question. The R is the rate, the discount rate. And once you punch that out, you should be able to get a figure in that regard. So if you don't have the table and you want to still use the annuity, then this is the formula you have to go with in that case. Okay. All right. Yes, Isaac, your hand is up. Hello. Sir, good evening. Yeah, good evening. yeah um, please, can you take me through uh, IS 23 borrowing cost? What is your specific issue there? Because we mentioned that we are uh, not going to teach a whole topic uh, so okay what is your okay. specific issue um uh, it's on specific loans and that's of for general one right so when you say that of general one what do you mean so you borrow mm -hmm. money to finance the activities of the company as compared to you borrow money to uh finance the uh, acquisition or manufacturing of a qualifying asset. If that is what you are looking for, then specifically, there are two things that we must understand. If a company borrows money for the general operations of the organization, general operations, okay, of the organization, then any finance cost they incurred Definitely, or they in care, definitely will be recognized in the PL. There is no yeah. miracle on that. But then, if the company borrows the money to finance the acquisition, so specific loans, if the money is for financing the acquisition, manufacturing, or constructing of qualifying assets, then that borrowing cost they in care must be capitalized, meaning it must be included in the initial cost of the assets. Now, this qualifying asset is simply an asset that requires substantial time to be ready for use or uh, ready for sale. So it could be an inventory we are buying or we are manufacturing and we are borrowing money for it, IAS2. It could be an investment property, IAS40. It could be an infrastructure, property, plant and equipment or just property, plant, and equipment, and that'll be IAS, you know, um, 16 in that case. So whatever class of asset we are dealing with, as far as we are borrowing money to acquire it, to manufacture it, the finance cost on that has to be included in the initial cost. If it is inventory, it will be included in the initial cost of the inventory. If it is an investment property, it will be included in the initial cost of the investment property. If it is property, plant, and equipment, it will be included in the initial cost of the property, plant, and equipment. Certainly, there are the capitalization rules available. It is only when the activities necessary to make the asset ready for use are ongoing that we capitalize the uh, interest expenses. If there, there are no activities ongoing or the asset is now ready for use or its intended sale, then capitalization will stop. Then the interest expenses will now be just written off in the PL, like how we will write it off for general operations or loan to finance general activities of the organization. So if you talk about specific and general loans, that is what you need to understand about how the treatment is supposed to be. Uh, I, I wish um, you take maybe a question on uh, a question containing these two types of uh, so that you know how it is uh, you go by. We have done a, a question about this in class. Right now, I can't solve a, a full question on these two guys. We did a question on that in class, 
borrowing costs when we're doing the non-current assets. So what you can do is you can go back to the portal and watch that video we did. We, I think we saw a very detailed question on that in the question kit under borrowing cost where there was specific loan and this. So you can watch that video again on the portal and you'll be able to uh, see that because I can't solve that question here. We are not here to solve questions in details like that. It will take, a, it will take me forever to finish that. So borrowing cost, page 66, we solved a certain question there. I'm just, I just wanna show you. So you can check it up on the portal if you were not in class that day and you'll be able to look at it. Not this. Uh, impairment inventories. Oh, come on. Did I make the page? Let me see. Borrowing costs. Oh, 71 rather. Okay. Let me bring it up. Okay, good. Yeah, this question, Naniyama. We solved this question in class, Naniyama. So you can go back and check out the video on IAS 23, the IFRS masterclass. We did that and we solved this question in class. And it is a general loan and specific loan. So you can go and watch the playback of this video because I can't solve this question in class. It's a Q&A session and I can't solve the, this question is detailed, it will take me a longer time to finish. So we've solved this question already on the portal. You can go check it out if you missed the class for this one, and then you can see how it is done in that regard. Yeah, Phyllis, your hand is up, what you got? Okay, Ishura, please, mm -hmm. um, mine has to do with financial assets. When it's stated in the question that there is redeemable at premium, at par or at discount, I, I don't know, but if you can clarify those three for me, how it's treated in the last final year or so. Okay, so let me go back to the illustration I used in the case of Timothy. So if you remember this illustration I used in the case of Timothy, I said it is redeemed at a premium of 10%. So mm -hmm. if it is redeemed at a premium, then you will take 10, whatever percentage that the premium is of the nominal mm -hmm. value and add it to the nominal value. That is why I put here 11,000 because the nominal value is 10,000. But if it will redeem at 10%, meaning it will redeem it at extra thousand over the 10,000. So it means we will give them 11,000. So if it is okay. redeemed at premium, the final year, the figure goes up by whatever percentage that is given to you. Okay. Then if it is redeemed at par, that means it to be redeemed at the nominal value. So whatever the nominal value is, that is the same figure you bring here, 10,000. That's the nominal value. That is redemption okay. at par. So at okay. premium, the figure will go up. At par, the figure will be down. Rarely will they say discount, but if it is at a discount, then the figure will be reduced by the percentage. So if, for instance, it says it will be redeemed at a discount of 15%, then in this case, in the final year, we'll have 7,500. Do you get the idea? We'll have yes. 7,500. So that is the distinction between the three things, discount, par, premium. Oh, okay. Um, Ishra, what about uh, payable in arrears in advance? What? <laughs> Still financial. What, financial. what in arrears in advance? What did you say? I didn't hear that. I, I said what the financial liability uh -huh. is paid in arrears or advance. In a, yeah, usually we expect interest should be paid in arrears, meaning the interest will be paid at the end of the year. So in arrears, it means your shadow will go this way, balance brought forward, then interest, then payment, then balance brought down. So we expect that this is arrears because normally interest will be paid at the end of the year. But then if interest is paid in advance, that means the interest will be paid rather at the beginning of the year. So if that is the case, interest will be paid at the beginning of the year, then our format will go like this, balance brought forward, 
then we would have to make the payment because it has the beginning of the year. Then we will get the amount outstanding at the beginning of the year, right? Then we'll apply the interest on that amount outstanding and get a closing balance. Oh, Does that make sense? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's see what else do I have? I have a couple of things here. What's it then? So kindly explain self-review threat and advocacy threat. Right. Advocacy threat is advocacy threat. Self-review threat is self-review threat. Go and sit down somewhere. Uh, okay, so let me uh, explain that. Um, self-review threat, like the name suggests, is a threat that arises if the accountant is required to review okay, to review or report on something that he was involved in preparing or designing. Sounds good. The accountant is reviewing or reporting on something that he was involved in preparing or fixing something he, she was involved in preparing or making. That is self-review threats. That's self-review threats in that particular case. So if you remember the question that we looked at, I don't think we looked at this question though because we had discussed it earlier. Kwejo Kusi, uh, let me see if I can just bring it up and illustrate it to you. I'm not going to solve it. Just illustrating it to you. Uh, let's see. If you remember the performance evaluation test that we did, there was an ethics question. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, this one. This one. You are told in this question that in calculating the loan interest staff, on staff, the account officer is in error applied 5% instead of 10% rate. KK is a beneficiary of the loan, of the staff loan and a member of the staff loan committee. He does this. He's the one who is concerned about staff loan. So when you ask him to review something that relates to something that he was involved in approving, that is a self-review threat. Because anytime the accountant is put in a position to review, to report on something that he was involved or she was involved in preparing, in deciding, then certainly that is going to be a self-review threat. So that is the concept about self-review threat. Then your second scenario or statement was advocacy. To advocate means to promote the point of view Okay, promote the point of view, represent, promote the point of view, represent, or uh, carry out transactions on behalf of somebody. Okay, so perform transactions on behalf of somebody. That is a self, sorry, that's an advocacy threat. Perform transactions on behalf of someone or the entity, okay? Someone or the entity. That is an advocacy threat. That's an advocacy threat. So anytime we are representing a group of people, we are representing the entity, we are doing something on behalf of the entity, that means we are advocating for the entity. So for instance, if the entity, we are the auditors of the entity, I don't know the context in which your question is though, but it, let's say we are the auditors of the entity. Then the entity says, hey, by the way, we are going to bid for a government contract. So we want you to be part of the team who will go and negotiate the contract with the government and make sure we win the contract. And when we win the contract, you guys, you will get some 10% of the contract as your fee or the company is going for a loan from the bank. 
Then they said, hey, we want you to be part of the team to negotiate the loan terms with the bank. What it means is that we are promoting the interest of the bank, sorry, of the entity. We are representing the entity. Sometimes the entity will even remove itself and say, hey, can you guys do this on our behalf and make sure the deal is carried out? Anytime we perform, we promote, we represent, do something on behalf of the client entity or our entity or a group of people, then we are going to be exposed to what we call advocacy threat. When this happens, there is going to be more familiarity. There is more fees we stand to gain. So it is likely to affect our integrity as uh, accountants or our objectivity in that particular case. If care is not taken, this may cause us to be misbehave. So it will even affect our professional behavior as auditors, or sorry, as accountants. Auditors, accountants, we can use these interchangeably. So KBOID, that is the issue about uh, self-interest threats and advocacy threats. Let me know if that makes sense for you in that case. Then what else I got? Timothy said, sir, please, if the entity revalue its leased property, does it affect the lease liability measurement? Please, 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 Timothy, you are valuing the property. So that is IAS 16 situation. Go and sit down. It doesn't affect the lease liability. <laughs> it doesn't affect your lease liability. Because, you know, after the initial measurement, on subsequent measurement, you account for the lease property as per whatever applicable standard. It could be IAS 16. It could be IAS 40 or something like that. So when you revalue it, your lease liability is still the same. You just continue to carry it out the way it has to be carried out. Sounds good? So it doesn't affect us. Okay. Brad Timothy. Please, how is right of use recognized in leases? Ooh, I think we established this during our master class on leases very well. And we had a fun time doing that. We recognize leases by looking at two things. Uh, who is directing the usage of the assets? Okay, direct the usage of the assets. And then number two, there is uh, significant economic benefit flowing to the entity. So do we direct the usage of the assets? If yes, then we have leased the assets and we can account for it as per, let's see, accounting IFRS 16. But if we don't direct the usage of the assets, then it is not a lease, it's a normal rental. So for instance, let's say that I am, I bake bread, okay? So I need a delivery van. I bake bread and I need a delivery van. So I go to um, uh, Phyllis and I, I lease or I take Phyllis's car in that particular case. So let's say this is our delivery van. And Phyllis say, hey, Shira, you could use the delivery van on Monday. You could use it on Tuesday. But guess what? On Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, please. Make sure you return my delivery van by Wednesday morning because myself, I also sell pancake. I have to go and do delivery for pancake. Now, so even though in the context of mentioning, in the context of statement, we, I will say, oh, I have leased the van from uh, Phyllis. Can I recognize this as a lease? No. Why? Because I don't direct the usage. And then significantly, future economic benefit doesn't flow to me because I only use it on Mondays, on Tuesdays, and the rest of the days, it's used by the supposed lessor. So in this kind of scenario, we will deal with it as a rental and not recognize anything in the financial statements relating to it. All we do is once the rent is due, we recognize it in the PL accounts and that is all. But if we have leased a car and the car is with me, I use it from Monday to Sunday, and if the car breaks down, Phyllis has to change it for me or give me another car. And he, she doesn't have control over anything relating to the car. What the heck? Then that is a lease. So we will apply lessee accounting as per IFRS 16. So if you ask about how do we identify lease, that is how we identify lease. And if you remember, 
uh, we had a very beautiful scenario that I shared with you guys the other day on the identification of lease. I don't know. Let me see if I can see the scenario and bring it up. A setting paper, corporate reporting. Uh, la, 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 la. Uh, is it even here? Let me see if I can see it, if I can run you down on that scenario again, because identification of lease is one of the critical issues that you must understand. Let me see if I can find, nope, that's not it. Uh, if I don't see it, then it's not that it's not here. Okay, so now this paper is outside your league, but the illustration is what I'm interested in. This is a paper of corporate reporting, Institute of Chartered Accountant, England and Wales. Uh, but the illustration, it's there. And uh, we saw this illustration. In the first illustration of transfer, we are told that uh, transfer will transport React product by road using tankers. A tanker consists of an engine and a separate container. Transfer, transfer owns the tanker and will also provide the drivers. Transfer can use its tankers, its containers to transport chemical for different customers. For different customers. Now, transfer here is the company from whom uh, React is leasing the assets. So if the lessor, support lessor, can use the containers to transfer chemicals for other people, then we don't use it. Then it says, but containers require cleaning if different chemicals are transported. So in the context of this scenario, it is not a lease. It's a renter because the lessor can use the asset to transfer other chemicals there. Then in the B aspect of the scenario, Duton will supply larger containers than transfer. Duton will transport containers by road and rail to React customers. And then React will have access to 15 specific containers for nine years. Did you see that? So React will have access to 15 specific containers for nine years. Now listen to the breakdown. Duton owns the containers. Each container is designed for the particular type of chemical which React produces. The 15 containers will be stored at React's premises and will only be used by React. So you realize that in the first scenario, we don't control it because the company can use it for other customers. But in the case of Duton here, it's for us 15 years. We have, sorry, nine years, we have 15 cars. And it is only by our chemicals. It is even located in our premises or on our premises. So in this case, the second scenario qualifies for leases. And so we have to apply, let's see, accounting IFRS 16. So when we talk about identification of lease, that is what you need to understand. Do we direct the usage of the asset? Uh, will significant economic benefit from the asset actually flow to the entity? So if you ask about identification of leases, Gladys, that's what you need to look out for. Then, how right of use is recognized? I mean, it's right of use. You debit right of use is an asset. So you debit right of use. And on subsequent measurement, you depreciate it using either the lease term or the economic useful life of the asset. Now, we use the economic useful life of the asset if ownership will transfer at the end of the lease term. But if ownership will not be transferred at the end of the lease term, then forget about it. We just uh, use the lease term to depreciate the asset. So that is how right of use is recognized and dealt with in the financial statement and also how lease itself is recognized, how lease is recognized. So that is the issue about that. Let's see what else do I have? Let me know if that makes sense for you. Yes, Timothy, you're on this up. What you got? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm, please, so I want to make another, I want to ask another question. Like in terms of these leases, okay, let's say that um, if the statement says that 
in the trial balance, there's no list like this in the trial balance. Only one at the, uh, the debit side. And then they are saying that that amount include the initial deposit and then the first payment. Okay. Now, in the footroom, the footroom, they are saying that part of the, the first payment is in the rental, rent, uh, this rental. This, I guess, my What? What? Yeah. Let's say that on the tribal balance, you know, the debit side is 5,000. And then they are saying that 2,000 is uh, initial deposit. How can we have 3,000? Relax, relax. How can we have lease on the debit side? There is nothing about it's a liability. If mm -hmm. it's on the debit side, that is the right of use. So the basis of your question it's, is it's, it's a lease payment. Okay, the, go ahead. Let me see. Flat. So that like in the trial, they said uh, lease payment. And they put the amount in the the debit side. That is uh, the first column. So and that is less five thousand there. Then they are saying that two thousand of this amount. Oh, a few four. I don't know. Your voice is dropping. I don't know. Fix your network and come back, so that we can go to other questions here. So check and fix your network. Then maybe you can come back. Let me pick up some charts here quickly. Bebora said, please say, explain the methodology of PIFA in measuring uh, what PFM performance. What do you mean by methodology of measuring PIFA performance? I don't understand the context of the question. What do you mean by methodology of measuring PIFA performance? There are seven pillars we use to measure uh, the performance of an organization, sorry, the financial management system of the organization in that particular case. There is just a thin line distinction. Let me bring you up uh, this. Let me see if I can get you up with this and then tell you something about that. Let's see. Do we have this here? PSAF. Okay, good. Let me bring out my PIFA. Okay. And then share some slide on that. Page 97. Just scroll down a little bit. Not too much. Good. So 97. Uh, let's see, what do I have? Now, listen to this. The PIFA methodology refers to the government financial statistics terminology where possible to provide a standard basis of reference. But this does not imply that PIFA is only relevant where GFS methodology is used. PIFA is adaptable to situations where other classification and standards are used. So, Actually, when we talk about the issue relating to the PIFA methodology, what we are saying, okay, what we are saying here is it relates to the approach that we use to measure the performance or the issue relating to the financial management of the organization or for the entity. So for instance, if you realize what we have here, what constitute Oh, sorry, what constitutions PIFA cover? Sorry, what institutions PIFA cover? So the core PIFA methodology was initially focused on central government. So that is why we are going to be using those issues, those seven pillars that we use. So when we talk about the methodologies of PIFA for measuring public financial management performance, we are talking about those seven pillars, budget, reliability, transparency of public finance, management of assets, uh, uh, policy-based strategy, and all these. Only that, only that, whilst we're going to be using these pillars to measure the efficiency of the public financial management system, there has to be a reference against which we will use it to determine whether it is good or not good. That reference is what is established as the PIFA methodology as the PIFA methodology. So when we use the seven pillars, budget reliability, asset management, transparency, and all that to measure the performance of the 
public financial management system of the government to determine whether it is good or bad, we would have to look at it based on a certain criteria, which is set by the IMF, the people who are in Ghana now to deal with our problem. And usually those methodologies are for the central government. That is why we look at budget reliability. That's why we look at um, management of assets and liabilities. That's why we look at budget implementation and all those things, because these things are more central government related. So the PIFA methodology simply refers to the indicators that we are using to measuring the central government's performance with reference to uh, the measuring whether the entity's public financial management system is effective or efficient. So if you ask about the methodology, that is what we are talking about uh, there in relation to that. Let me know if that makes sense for you. That's what you are looking for. There's another question here for, from Kenneth. He said, Sir, when we are treating government's grant IS20, we at a point worked in months. Kindly re and state the point or scenario where we have to work in months. There is no point, no scenario where you have to work in months. It is about what you are comfortable with. That is what you work with. The reason why in that particular question I changed into months was because the years were some way. It was 10 points. They had used the asset for like, is this four years, three months or so? And so I decided that Four years, three months, how do you get that in years? Do you do 4.3? No, it will be wrong. So in that case, to make it easy for me, let me convert the entire economic useful life into months. Then how long they have used the asset also into months, then I will get my answer. So there is no point in changing from years to years based on the specific question. It is how comfortable you will be with for your calculation, that is why in that question when we were solving, I decided to move from years to months. So it's not that there is a scenario that will make you change from years to month. It is not, if it is not reasonable for me to determine the years, then I rather convert into months, then I work peacefully. So it's about comfortability and uh, rationality, in my opinion. Are you getting it? It's about comfort. Uh, comfortability or rationality in that case. So we don't have anything like a specific scenario where we have to change. You only change when it is comfortable for you or how comfortable it is for you to have your answer. Some of you guys are joining. Uh, if there are any specific questions, you raise your hand, we bring you up or you put it in the chat. If you have a lot of noise in your background, then just put it in the chat for us. Then we go away. YouTube, let me see. There are a couple of questions there. Let me see if what I got there. Iban Bone said, uh, what are the areas to consider when choosing to use CAT to audit? Or what are key things auditors should consider before taking options of CAT? Number one, if the entity uh, internal control systems are IT-based, what do you expect? The internal control systems of the company is IT-based. Why not? That's very, very important. Number two, if you want to really have a reasonable uh, sample size to help you reduce the detection risk, why not use the cuts? Uh, the the cuts will help you to have a reasonable sample size. If you want to quickly identify unusual transactions in the entity's financial information, why not you use cuts? Because once you put their transactions in the uh cuts, you will be able to put in whatever you want and that unusual transactions will be able to come up. So definitely if the company is IT based, you have to use the cuts. You want a reasonable sample size so that you reduce uh, your detection risk, fine. If you want to identify unusual transactions easily, fine, you have to use the cut. So these are the uh, some of the areas or reasons why the auditor may go for part to help in the audit. Benedicta Manqua said, please, sir, please, will the COVID levy be applicable in our tax exams? Yes, it is applicable. 
that COVID, le COVID levy was passed long time ago. So in the computation of your VAT, the COVID levy has to be built into the system. The rule for any law being examinable in the ICA is six months after it is passed. So uh, six months after it becomes effective. So once it becomes effective, six months from then, the examiner can ask you questions on it. And the COVID levy was passed a long time ago. So it is going to be something that will feature in the VAT questions. Protocol Boy said, good evening, Shira. You are doing a great job. Can you briefly explain how defect of material can be incorporated in the preparation of the various functional budgets? Come on, take it easy. Defect of materials. Oh, that means you are looking at the material usage budget. That's the only place it comes in. So if you are looking at the material usage budget, this is how you build it in quickly. You look at the material required based on the production unit. The material required based on the production unit. You calculate for that. Now, this is your production unit multiplied by the material usage per unit. That's how you get that figure. Then if you uh, see that you are going to be having some... Okay, I'm coming. If you see that there is going to be some defective output, then definitely we would have to build that into the system in that particular case. However, however, chances are we have some of the material available. So what is going to be happening is that we are going to be bringing in. So you bring your production unit. So from the production budget, you bring in material usage per unit, and that gives you the material usage for the production unit. Now, if there is going to be normal loss, okay, it, then you have to build it to the system. Now, anytime there is going to be defective or normal loss, it's going to be increasing how much we would have to pay in that particular case. So if this is the material required based on the production unit, and the examiner says, oh, 3% of material required are going to be defective, what is going to be happening is that this figure, now there is a way this figure will be derived that represents 97%. So if I want my normal loss, it's going to be three over 97 times this particular figure that I got here. And that gives you the normal loss. And that gives you the final answer for the material required for the production unit. So if you ask how that is built up in the question, that is how it is built up. It is going to be calculated and whatever ratio or percentage the examiner gives you, you work that divided by whatever figure you had prior that and you are going to be getting your material usage. So that is how you build the, you build the normal loss into the functional budget. Nassif said, thank you very much. Well understood now. Imano Kweji said, please, do you do face-to-face -face class? All our lectures are currently uh, online via Zoom. Currently online via Zoom. We now enjoy Zoom than face to face. So currently all lectures are online via Zoom. Let me see, I got some other chats coming in. Sir, please, I sent the question to you via WhatsApp. My network is messing up. The 800 in the debit side of the trial balance referred to lease payment and no lease liability in the trial balance. So what is the issue? Like I said, if your question is not specific, I can't provide you with any answer in that particular case. Kenneth said, yes, I understand. Okay. How do you treat a provision that appears in the trial balance and the notes? I don't understand that. When you say a provision that appears in the trial balance and the notes, uh, oh, what do you mean? If I get a context of what you're saying, in trial balance, there is provisions there. Then in the notes also, there is provisions there. So the movement, so let's say the trial balance, provision in the trial balance is 500. Then in the notes, they said provision has, uh, it's now 300. Then that means the provision has reduced. Reduction in provision is an income. So then the 200 becomes income that will recognize in the p &L accounts. Then when you go, whatever provision it is, I don't know what kind of provision it is. If it is provision for bad debt, then the new figure 300 
will be less from trade receivables on the face of the statement of financial position. So if it is provision for bar debt, then the balancing figure will be less from trade receivables. That's how you deal with provision. I don't know if that is what you were looking for. Uh, let me know if that makes sense for you in that case. Yes, Phyllis, your hand is up. What you got? Sure, please. Can you touch on challenges of public financial management? Challenges of public financial management. Yes. Now, when we talk okay. about uh, challenges of public financial management, there are a lot of challenges on that. Uh, number one, we can talk about issues relating to... Now, the way you approach this question in the first place is to ask yourself, why is it that there are a lot of corruption in the system even though there are a lot of institutional authorities to do them. So for instance, there is public accounts committee. Why don't we see them well doing their job? There is auditor general, there is ministry of finance, there is parliament there. Why is it that there is AG, attorney general is there, then the security services are all there. Now, all these people play a key role when it comes to the efficiency of the public financial management system. So if we understand it from that line, that these are the institutions that will ensure that there is efficiency in the public financial management system, then if we now come into the challenges of public financial management system, then we can come in with a couple of points. Like for instance, number one, one of the challenges of public financial management system is the issue in relation to political affiliations right? Issues relating to political affiliations. Now, the authorities know that what is going on is wrong. They have established that, hey, you cannot pay the Public Financial Management Act 2016, Act 921. You cannot pay for something that is not budgeted for. You cannot spend above your vote. Per the Public Procurement Act, there are things that when you procure, they must follow certain rules, certain uh, orders. However, people break these rules. They don't obey the financial management systems in place, but nothing is done with it for it. Why? Because of the political affiliations. Hence, it becomes a challenge and makes the public financial management system not to be effective. So even though we have established that don't spare money they are, that they have not approved, don't spare money beyond your vote, don't procure things without following the Public Procurement Act, but because of political affiliation, that doesn't work. Like the National Cathedral fiasco. By this time, we should jail everybody. We should jail people for spending money on that in that particular case because if you are spending state money and the money is not... Uh, procurement is not being done in accordance with the Public Procurement Act, that is against the law. But why are we not jailing anybody? Because of public political what, affiliation. So that makes it impossible to make the uh, public financial management serious. Like I say always, I have on my table here the Bej Khalifa uh, on my table here. And the, the deal for that was around 1.8, the architectural, 1.8 million dollars for the architecture by your national cathedral allegedly it's being paid for 12 million dollars who the heck paid for that and why are we not jailing anybody but that is one of the challenges there in that particular case number two is also the issue relating to lack of funding has also been a challenge of public financial management system. Like I mentioned earlier, public accounts committee is required to review the auditor general's account and also uh, do a public hearing and call on people who have been involved in financial irregularities. But as at this time that we are in 2022, I think they are now reviewing, is it 2019 or so, or 2020 or so? And one of the reasons why they are not able to do their job very well it's because of what? Lack of funding. So many of the state enterprises, state institutions that are to ensure that there is effective public financial management system in place, 
lack the funding requirement, hence makes public financial management not effective as it is supposed to be. So political affiliation, lack of funding is also an issue in that particular case that we can talk about. Number three will be the issue relating to um, lack of expect expertise in various institutions. You see, one of the cad uh, uh, cadence of uh, public financial management effectiveness is value for money. Now, who determines what value for money is? Now, again, this is just academic purposes. So like I say all the time, you put aside your political colors. I don't give a fuck about that. Uh, so you just put it aside and we focus on what we are going to do and go away. So who determines what how value for money is? Like who determines that? We don't know who determines that. Now, determination of value for money, it's about economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. How do we measure that? There are, we lack the expertise in most of the government institutions, like parliament. How many people are available in parliament that have the knowledge, the expertise on how we determine economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and equity? So really, the people who are supposed to even bring the law and play the uh, oversight role themselves lack the knowledge to play that role. So it makes or it could make public financial management system ineffective. Ineffective. So that is one of the issues about the challenges that the public financial management system has that we can uh, talk about and bring about in that particular case. And definitely the issue in relation to lack of accountability, lack of accountability and transparency. Again, this is because of, again, political affiliation, the laws not working, okay? Transparency is a problem of government over the years in that particular case, okay? Why is no information allegedly at the procurement authority or procurement board about how we procured the $12 million architect to design the National Cathedral. The Burj Khalifa, a $1.5 billion project, they did a peer review competitive analysis before selecting the architect for that building. What is so exclusive about the architects that you have to pay him $12 million for a national cathedral, which is allegedly just $350 million. So lack of accountability, lack of transparency is also another challenge of public financial management system. So these are some of the things that we can share our thought on. So like I said, the way you approach such questions is just to look at, okay, who, which people are supposed to ensure this thing runs well? Why are they not doing their job? So once we know why they are not doing their job, that becomes a challenge for efficient public financial management system in that case. So that is the issue about that. Now, these are some of the things I can say on that. Uh, Phyllis, let me know if that makes sense for you. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. How do we differentiate between bases, methods, and uh, techniques of accounting measurement? Hey, Bay, what do you mean by this plenty? Bases, techniques, accounting. No, 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 relax, relax. There is measurement basis, relax. Okay, send them, baby little girl, relax. There is measurement basis. The measurement basis are the methods used to determine the value to be placed on an item in the financial statement. So this is where you talk about your historical cost. Mm -hmm. You talk about your net realizable value. You can talk about your present value. You can talk about your fair value. These are the measurement bases. These are the measurement bases used to determine the value of an element in the financial statement. Number two, the accounting bases. These are the concepts that we use, the accounting concept that we use. For instance, the issue relating to um, accrual basis, cash basis, modified accrual, 
modified cash basis. These are accounting basis. Okay, these are the accounting basis. Then the accounting techniques are the methodologies used in the preparation of the financial statements. And this is where we talk about fund accounting, commitment accounting. Uh, fund accounting, commitment accounting. What else we got there? Environmental accounting. Okay. So fund, commitments, environmental accounting. These are the accounting techniques. So baby little girls, and um, let me know if that makes sense for you. The measurement basis are the methods we use to determine the value of an element to be incorporated in the financial statement. The accounting basis are the uh, approaches or assumptions we use in the preparation of the financial statement. And that is your accrual basis, cash basis, modified cash, modified accrual. The accounting techniques are the uh, methodologies used in keeping of government accounts or keeping of government books. And that is where fund accounting, commitment accounting, you know, vote accounting. Yeah, I was looking for that guy. I don't know where it went from my brain. And now he's back. Vote accounting. All right. So I think you're typing, you, you messed all of them up, but this is the difference between them. Let me know, Senam, if that makes sense for you now in that regard. And this is for public sector. Now, there's a done deal question waiting for you in the exam hall on these guys. Question 1A, it's a done deal. Not that all the three will be there, but one of them will be there. Which one will be there? When you get to the exam or you ask the examiner, <laughs> he will tell you the answer. <laughs> so that is the issue about that. On Senam, let me know if that makes sense for you. Any other questions, you raise your hand, we bring you up and uh, or you put it in the chat for me. On April, oh, come on, man. Timothy, you can't let me do book here. Charlie, what the heck? This is a whole thing. Please, I'll look at it for you after the call. Give me a call after the lecture and I'll look at it for you because it's a whole scenario you've sent to me. And uh, I can look at it for you after the class. So after the lecture, please give me a call. And I, can, I can provide you with something on that because I can't read the whole thing and do the treatment here. Senam said, yes, daddy. Okay, you <laughs> might Yes, just when your hand is up, what you got? Daddy Shira. Yes, ma. Please, can you touch on conceptual framework? What about conceptual framework? Everything about it. No, no, I'm not teaching the whole conceptual framework. Oh, oh yeah, just touch on it. And maybe ever touch me, I'll touch it. Yes, hey. you know. The way you are saying touch, touch like that. Uh, I want to touch you. Not you should have. Mm. Don't touch me. I don't like to be touched. I'll I'm touch sensitive you. to touching. <laughs> In fact, I'll touch you. <laughs> I'm sensitive to touching. Okay, so the issue about conceptual framework has to do with um, a couple of things that we need to take into consideration. Number one is the objectives of financial statement. That is the first thing about the conceptual framework. Those of you with my book, I mean, that's on page 10. If you have my book on financial reporting, the first thing is objective of financial statements. So what are the objectives of the various financial statements? Statement of financial performance to assess financial performance. Statement of financial position to know the financial position of the company. What are the assets? What are the liabilities? Statement of changes in equity to look at the movement in the equity of the company for the period under review in that particular case. Then. Uh, the cash flow statement to look at the cash inflows and the cash outflows for the period under review. Then the notes to the financial statement is to provide us with some knowledge on the accounting policies we used in the preparation of the financial statement. And then also the other workings that we used in the preparation of the financial statement. So that's the first part of the conceptual framework. Then suddenly the underlining assumptions, you know this already, accrual basis, and then going concern basis. These are something the examiner can ask you. Then we have the, uh, whatever, business entity concept and those things, prudence concept and those things. But these are the two 
underlining assumptions that we use to prepare the financial statement. Then certainly qualitative characteristics of financial statement is also there. We have the primary qualitative characteristics of financial statements and then also, sorry, fundamental qualitative characteristics and then enhancing qualitative characteristics. Now, the way we illustrate this to you guys is that the fundamental are the basics. They are the basics. So issues relating to relevance and then faithful representation. So for instance, any information, information is said to be relevant if it omission misstatement in the financial statement will affect the decision-making uh, abilities of the users of the financial statement. So materiality is key here in determining that information. Faithful representation simply means recording transactions in the financial statement to represent what they are supposed to be representing in the financial statement. And so economy of the transaction must be recorded rather than its legal form in that particular case. So this is where substance over form is going to be coming in. These are fundamental qualitative characteristics. But you see, we don't just rely on the fundamental. There are other qualitative characteristics that will make the financial statement complete. And the way we illustrate this always is, for instance, a lady having makeup. Now, when a lady finished uh, bathing before she dresses, she's going to be having her fundamental. I mean, uh, putting just some few things up in that particular case. She looks good. She finished dressing. Then she will do the enhancing. Now, if you have been with any lady uh, or in a corporate environment or something like that before, when they get up from their car and they are entering into a meeting or they are going into a meeting or going out, one thing they do is they reach out to their purse and they will pick up their makeup pouch and then quickly do some touch on. It is called enhancing qualitative characteristics. The foundations are there, they are necessary, but we need to polish it to make it more beautiful, more pretty in that case. The same thing happens to the financial statement preparation. We need to have some other characteristics that makes it complete so that the users can accurately rely on that information. And that is where comparability comes into the picture. Um, timeliness, information must be provided when it is needed. Then the issue relating to um, mini account verifiability, you know, and uh, I think there is one more. Understandability. Understandability, right. Information must be presented in a manner to make it easier to understood by the users of the financial statement. So yeah, that's basically the idea about that. So the elements of the financial statement, the basic assumptions uh, of the financial statement, but most importantly, the qualitative characteristics of the financial statement, the fundamental and the enhancing qualitative characteristics. So about conceptual framework, if you ask, I mean, that is what I can say there. Let me know if that makes sense for you. That yes, that is Shira. Thank you. Okay. Uh, but it's your last one, last one. Okay. Uh, benchmarking. Mm -hmm. Hey, that one too. Can you touch on it? Uh, benchmarking, it's in management accounting. Uh, let me see if I can just grab my slide and show you something on that. Um, M A. Twenty twenty one. Okay, let me see if I can get it rather right here. It's a concept of trying to match our performance with a with an indus with industry players' performance to see if we are doing well or not, so that we can improve upon our performance as an organization. It's one of the your friend is saying, um, one of the tools for evaluation. So let me see if I can just show you that quickly and we explain the concept benchmarking come on i'm already done here right there you go so benchmarking is a process for obtaining a measure so like i said the idea is that benchmarking is the management process which involves comparing 
or comparison of competences with best practices, including compare, comparison beyond the organization's own industry. So that's the idea about benchmarking. So for instance, if the quality of our products, what is the quality of our products? We will measure our product quality as against international recognized quality uh, measures. Then we will see if we are getting closer or we are, we are exceeding on that. Okay, what are the test of, test of controls we have available? If for our product that we are manufacturing, we do 20 tests before we say, oh, it's okay. On the, on the average in the industry, how many tests is every company undertaking or performing? So if we realize that internationally, there are some companies that are doing 200 tests and we are doing just 20 quality control tests, then we are below the benchmark. Now, so what do we set as the benchmark? It depends on the organization. We can set, use an international uh, criteria to set the benchmark and measure our performance against that, or we can use a bigger uh, competitor and then we will measure our performance against that. The idea is that we want to identify what to do and why we do it. We want to have knowledge about what the industry does in that particular case so that we can fully be committed to achieve those best practices. So product quality is important. If we are doing 20 tests and somebody is doing 200 tests, you better find out what the heck is going on with the 180 tests extra. What are they testing? <laughs> what are they testing? So you need to find out and find out if you are doing only 20 and they are doing 200, no wonder their product is winning awards. No wonder their product is being accepted in the marketplace. That is the concept about benchmarking. So if now this is in your ebook, man accounting ebook, what I'm referring to here is in your man accounting ebook. So the idea generally is about focusing on best practices. What are the things that is that are being done within the industry? best practices, best practices. And then we will strive for continuous improvement. That is TQM, total quality management. There is always, there is nothing like we are the best. There is always room for improvement. Actually, the sky is not the limit, but it's the beginning because beyond the sky, there is something there. So striving for continuous improvement, how do you do that? You need to benchmark your performance against what is being done in the industry. Then we needed to maintain competitive edge. Like I said, if you are doing 20 tests and someone is doing 200, the person will definitely be competitive than you in the context of that. So we want to make sure that we maintain our competitive edge as a company. And that is the idea generally about uh, benchmarking. In our main class next week, we will be talking about this again. I'll be sharing some you know, thoughts with it because there are types of benchmarking that you need to know about. So in the main class, I'll be going through the full notes as well. Or you can read that in the notes. And then in our main class, I will finish up with it because it's a whole discussion on its own. But the idea is we are packing our uh, performance against an institution better than us or an international uh, standard requirement to see if it is better than them or how close we can get to them. And the purpose is we want to continuously improve the quality of our product. That's the idea about benchmarking. So in the main class, I will go over this and then we are, we're going to be looking at it in that particular case. Kenneth, Thank your you. hand is up. What you got? Yes, Kenneth, your hand is up. What you got? Yeah, hello. Sure. Yeah. Yes, I guess with a little clarification. I, what did you say? I said I just need a little clarification uh -huh. on um, something I captured during um, the time we're treating IES 38. The time we're treating um, what? IES 38. Okay. Yes. Um, you said um, 
the following must be present in order for us to capitalize. Relax, 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 relax. I don't know, your voice is a little down. Let me just put on my second headset and is it better? Yeah, go. Let me see. Is it better now? Yeah, it's better. Okay. So I'm saying that when we're treating IAS 38, mm -hmm. um, I captured something. I just need a little clarification. Okay. We're saying that um, um, these abbreviations that we wrote, sector, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, separately uh, um, identifiable assets, mm -hmm. estimation of course, like that abbreviation we wrote. Yeah. We said that uh, where the criteria is not met, yeah, any development expenses shall be recognized in the profit or loss. Yeah. What I want to understand is that um, in every event, are we supposed to meet all the five, the six criteria, or no. um, in a question? Uh, please go ahead. No, go, go, go. Finish. Yes. So what I want to know is that uh, are these six factors always supposed to be present? Or if majority is present, then we can go by that. Right. We emphasize on the fact that separately identify is not an issue. So that's not a headache. Um, a economic, a reliable estimation of the cost is not an issue. That will be directly stated in the question. So our problem will be, when is it ready for the market, commercial viability, technical feasibility in that particular case, and then resource available to sell. So we said that usually in the question, S is not a beef. E will be directly, that will be the figure they will give you that we've spent 10,000, we spent 20,000 on development. So that is not an issue. But then commercial viability of the product. When can we take the product to the market or can we sell this product? And technical visibility, these are two key issues that will be in the question technically. So even though we say there are six issues, some of them are just embedded in the question. So the examiner will make a statement about commercial viability or technical visibility. So if, for instance, they start development and they said, oh, there is a ready market for it. So they capitalized. But later on, they realized that the products cannot be ready for the market or they cannot complete the product. That means we have to write it off and recognize it in the PL account. So you will not get all the six issues in the question because it's default that S is organically there, E is organically there. What you will be seeing in the question and what the examiner will mention in the question relates to commercial viability and technical visibility. One of these will be clearly stated for you to then establish, do I capitalize or write off? Does that okay, thank you very much. Thank you very okay. much, I'm great. Right. Any other questions you raise your hand, we bring you up and we go. Let's see. Hey Ben, Ishira, as you are touching, can you please touch nicely and succinctly <laughs> the standard setting process? He already is a crystal. Don't get me into trouble. Look. Okay. So the standard setting process, uh, that's in the standard costing. We said um, there are, first, it goes with the definition of what standard costing is. So we said standard costing refers to the process of uh, estimation of cost. Okay. Estimation, estimation of cost. Um, recording of actual performance. Recording of actual performance or results. Comparing the actual performance with the estimate. So comparison with actual with estimate. And then we investigate. That is where variance analysis comes into the picture. So that is the stages involved in standard costing. That is the stages involved in standard costing in that particular case. So we estimate the cost. How much do we intend to incur? So maybe during the year, whatever. Let's say we are producing whatever, 
condoms or whatever we are producing. So if you are producing condoms, we estimate that we will incur a cost of $20 per condom, per pack of condom for the period under review. During the year, how much cost did we actually incur? Okay, because of the Russia-Ukraine war and whatever the heck, we actually spent $22 per pack. Uh-oh. So now we compare the two. We realize that we've spent more than we are supposed to spend. We spend an extra of $2. So we have to then investigate this $2. Why did we spend more? Maybe we didn't buy in bulk to enjoy quantity discounts. Maybe our procurement department was not doing the right work. They didn't, they, they didn't negotiate well in that particular case. So generally, when we talk about a standard setting process or stages, these are what we are talking about. And it comes from the definition of standard costing. That standard costing refers to the establishment of cost, collection or recording of actual performance, comparison of the actual performance with the estimate, and undertaking or performing variance analysis. So the stages are organically in the definition of what standard costing is. So let me know if... Oh, I meant stand accounting standard setting process. Oh, solid. Okay, so you're talking about accounting standard setting process. Okay. Let me bring my slide on that. Um for those of you with my book, you will see that here. Let me just bring it up here. Yeah, so standard setting process. I think I have some pointers here. Yeah. This is the standard setting process. Those of you with my book, you can find that on page 23. And uh, it's a theory the examiner can throw at you. So the six stages of standard setting, accounting standards. I didn't know that was what you were asking. So one is we, they set the agenda. Okay, so the International Accounting Standard Board will set the agenda. What are we looking for? Is it a new issue that we have to bring a new standard on? Or there is a previous standard that, you know, is inadequate to cover everything. Okay. There is a previous standard and it's inadequate to cover everything. So they set the agenda. What the heck do we want to do? Once they set the agenda, there is, you know, project planning in that particular case. Then they now decide how that agenda will actually be carried through, how they are going to be uh, developing the standard. So there is a technical director of technical activities and director of research. And these people are going to be involved in drawing up the project plan for the standard that the entity or the standard that the accounting standard board is thinking of setting in that regard. Then development of publication and discussion papers in that particular case. So they will put together what they think uh, the standard should cover or the issue is to seek public opinion and public discussion. So the board normally allows a 90-day period for comments on the discussion paper, but may allow a longer period on a major project. So there is a new standard we are developing or we are updating uh, other standards. So they would want to receive, you know, uh, comments from industry experts, other accounting institutions, uh, other accounting accountancy bodies from ACCA, ICA, ICAN, Nigeria, ICAEW, any other institution, then professionals, professors of various uh, universities and institutions, the ideas they have, they should bring it up. They should bring it up. Once they gather all the ideas of what the standard should look like, then they put all that together to develop what we call an exposure draft. This is uh, as per the requirements that you guys brought and what we think, this is what we feel should be included in this standard. This is what we how we feel the item is supposed to be treated. So they put all the thoughts together plus their own thoughts and understanding and research work in that particular case. And that exposure draft is also sent out for people to see the final work that we have put together, for people to see the final work. So again, that exposure draft will be in the public domain for all the people who contributed to see the final work that we, we are thinking of bringing in. 
So if after that, the body is satisfied about what has been done, then definitely they will develop it and then they will publish the IFRS. So you will see, you will be there now, IFRS 100. It's talking about what? It's talking about something. That is development and publication of the IFRS. Then suddenly you don't end there. You need to uh, undertake some procedures after issue because once the standard is implemented, it's in public places, it's in the public and companies can start using the standard, what is going to happen then is that we have to ensure if they understand everything. If they don't understand everything, then there will be some interpretation guidelines that will be issued at a regular interval to explain some clauses that were not clearly communicated. So it is like the Income Tax Act. There is something in the Income Tax Act that doesn't make sense. Now, when I say it doesn't make sense, I don't mean make sense like it's crazy, but doesn't make sense or people don't understand. So if you remember in tax, we said the commissioner general would then issue a practice note to explain the practical application of the thing that had been stated in the act. That is the same thing that happens after we issue new standards. The accounting standard board will come in with some interpretation and some other guidelines on how those standards are supposed to be implemented or used in that particular case. So that is basically the six stages that we go through in, in certain standards, in certain standards. Let me know if that makes sense for you in that case. Those of you with my book, if you remember, we mentioned that these are some of the things that you need to, I mean, read on your own in that case. So we didn't talk about them in class because these are fundamental issues to be discussed in that particular case. So that is the issue about that. Okay, you are welcome. Any other questions for me? Let's see YouTube if I got something there. Raymond Adongo said, please NP, what's up? What subject are you tackling today, please? It's a Q&A, uh, Raymond. Wekase Stanley said, hello, sir. I'm Wekase from Kenya. I appreciate the lessons. Always a pleasure. That's good. Emmanuel Kwachi said, sir, please, can you briefly explain flex budget for me? What is flex budget? Okay, flex budget is flex budget. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. <laughs> flex budget, what the heck? Flex budget is flex budget. Okay, so flex budget is simply a budget that takes into consideration changes in the outputs of the organization. The idea is that companies will prepare their fixed budget. Now, fixed budget is a budget that remains the same irrespective of the output level. So if we prepare the fixed budget, it is based on a certain budgeted unit. But then if we compare the fixed budget with the actual results, it will be inappropriate. Why? Because maybe your budget was prepared using 10,000 units. You wanted to produce 10,000 units. So you prepare budget for 10,000 units. But in actual sense, you produced 15,000 units. That means you've produced more units than you budgeted for. So if you want to use the original fixed budget with your actual budget to get your variance, that will be unfair. So to bring the fixed budget in line with the actual results, then we have to re-prepare the fixed budget, taking into consideration the actual units that has been produced, in this case, 15,000. And that new budget we pre prepare from the fixed budget based on the actual units we produced is what we refer to as the flexed budget. Is the word we refer to as flexed budget. So, um, Emmanuel Kwachi, that's the idea about flex budgets. Let me know if that makes sense for you uh, in that case. Let me know if that makes sense for you in that case. Um, any other questions, please? You raise your hand and we bring you up or you put it in the chat for us. Those of you who are here with us. Please, on IFRS 9, when do we multiply the effective rate percentage directly on the balance brought down? And when do we put it in the future value discounting formula? I don't know what you are talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. When do we multiply the effective rate? When do we put it in the future discounting formula? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand what you're talking about. 
I, I don't know if my head is trying to think about what you are thinking about. I don't know if I can say that though, but the idea here is um, if you are preparing the amortized cost schedule, like we illustrated earlier, you bring your balance brought forward, you bring your interest, you bring your payment, you bring your balance brought down. The effective rate is what is coming here. Okay, so you express the effective rate on the balance brought forward if you are preparing the amortized cost schedule. However, if you are dealing with convertible loan notes and you are splitting the convertible loan notes into equity and the debt components, then the way you determine the discount factor is always to also to use the effective interest rate. So in the context of that, that means you have to calculate the effective rate or the discount factor using the effective rate. So in that case, because you are looking for the discounting factor, then you can put it into the formula to calculate your discount factor in that regard. So if that is what you are asking and I get the contest, when we are preparing the amortized cost schedule, that's when we apply the effective rate on the balance brought forward so that we can get the interest for the year. But then we put the effective rate in the discounting formula when we are trying to find the present value of the convertible loan notes so that we can split it between the debt component and the equity component. I think that is what you are trying to say. Let me know if that makes sense for you in that case. Okay, um, any other questions? Oh, I'm good, let me go and sleep. Which is which? Let's see, um, I have some questions here. Say, so can you please explain capital budgeting in inflation effect? I don't get the context of the question of that. Capital budget in effective effect. I don't, I don't get the way in that case. Again, please comment on the best, the best way to analyze profitability ratio. I think that's what you are trying to say. The best way to analyze profitability ratios. Um, I have stated that my, my approach to this is do them together because they are intertwined. So start with asset turnover because that will tell you about how the entity is generating revenue and if, if effectively using the assets. Then you come to the gross profit margin because that will tell you about the cost of sales of the entity and whether they are rising as quickly as revenue is rising. Because when you're explaining the gross profit margin, you have to refer to the asset turnover to confirm your statement or otherwise. Okay, because if the asset turnover is rising, but the gross profit margin is falling, it means that even though the entity may be generating more revenue, its cost of sales are high. So when you are, that is why the gross profit margin is falling. So if I'm explaining gross profit margin, definitely I have to make reference to revenue generation or revenue impact of the company. Then after that, I can explain net profit margin. When I'm explaining net profit margin, Yes, I'm focusing on operating expenses and whether they are increasing or reducing, but I have to make reference to asset turnover. I have to make reference to gross profit margin. And they are connected so that you don't make contradictory statements in that particular case. So for instance, if your gross profit margin, it's increasing, but net profit margin is reducing, what is the meaning of that? It means that, and, and say your asset turnover is also rising, it means that the entity may be generating more revenue, but then their cost of sales are not rising as much as possible. Probably they are buying in bulk and hence enjoying quantity discounts. However, the operating expenses are high. Why? Because they are selling more. If you are selling more, it's likely you have to pay a lot of commissions. It's likely you have to buy a lot of delivery vans. So you are supposed you are going to be charging a lot of depreciation. And with this whole fuel price is going up, then you have to pay a lot of fuel expenses in terms of delivery. So if gross profit margin is higher than net profit margin, then these are some of the things coming up. So you're going to make reference to operating expenses, make reference to asset turnover, make reference to gross profit margin if I'm explaining the net profit margin in that particular case. Then, finally, Rosie or Rosalinda. Rosie is return on capital employed. 
So if you are explaining that, definitely you have to make reference to your asset turnover, to your gross profit margin, to your net profit margin, and definitely the nature of the capital employed of the company. And remember, we've said that the fact that asset turnover is rising and ROSI is rising does not mean the entity is efficiently using its assets. Because if during the year the company repay its loan notes and the capital employed reduces, then definitely asset turnover will go up, ROSI will go up. So it's not going up because the company did well. They are going up because there is a reduction in the capital employed. So my take will be this. They are interrelated. So if you can explain them in this order, then it can enrich your understanding so that you don't make contradictory statements in that particular case. So let me know, Eben, if that makes sense for you in that regard. Kenneth said, sir, what items do we post to the OCI in the context of single entity? Yeah, revaluation of assets will go there. Revaluation of assets will be in OCI. Now remember, revaluation surplus has to go there, but sometimes revaluation loss can also be recognized in the OCI if the loss is coming from previously upward revalued asset, then the loss will be recognized in OCI. So revaluation of asset will be recognized there. Deferred tax can be recognized in OCI. Usually the deferred tax is arising due to revaluation of assets. Then deferred tax will be recognized also in the OCI in that particular case. Then financial assets carried at fair value through OCI will also be recognized in OCI. What do you expect? The name is through OCI. So it will be recognized in OCI. What the heck? So it will be recognized there. So revaluation of assets, deferred tax, financial assets through OCI. Yeah, usually these are some of the things that will uh, be there in that particular case. Then this is a, a little bit outside your scope, but hedging, Exchange movement on hedging and the IFRS 9, that is like beyond your scope. So don't even think about it. Uh, can also be recognized in the OCI in that particular case. But the key takeaway for you will be, I mean, these three guys and uh, any other thing about that. So financial assets, deferred tax, revaluation of assets, these are recognized in the OCI in that particular case. So that is it about that. Kboy D, let me know if that is okay for you. YouTube, can you please uh highlight on flex budget again? Oh, yeah, they're good at that. Jelomi Aku said, Hello, sir. Per the pre-scene case study, what are the likely finance-related questions that may be asked? I don't know what you mean by likely finance-related question. There is financial statement preparation, there are financial statements prepared there. So you have to make sure you calculate your ratios and assess the liquidity position of the company, the solvency of the company, and the profitability of the company. So once these financial statements are given, it's likely that you are going to be assessing the performance of the company. Now, if you remember in the pre-scene, they stated that um, the company is seeking to go and acquire some 20 new stores. And so we have to look at their cash position in that regard to find out if really they have the capacity to buy that in that regard, then the inventory management system also from inventory holding days and all that can also be something that we look out for in that case. Then uh, can you please hit on how we do the calculation for change in working capital in investment appraisal? Okay, so the idea about working capital and investment appraisal is we use the movement. So let me bring an illustration. Let's say a company has sales and uh, the project is four years, one, two, three, four. The idea is that all working capital outflows must come as an inflow at the end of the reporting date, sorry, at the end of the project. So the project has four years life. Sales are respectively, let's say 10,000, 20,000, just to make it simple, 30,000. And then 40,000. So these are the sales. Then the question say that, says that the working capital requirement 
is 10% of the sales of the month. So what it means is that this is going to be 1,000, this is going to be 2,000, this is going to be 3,000, this is going to be 4,000. But you see, uh, and they said it is required at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the year. What it means technically then is that the actual working capital that we would take to our investment appraisal schedule, that we would take to our investment appraisal schedule will be in this form. Because it is required at the beginning of the year, the year one will come here as an outflow in year zero. The year two will come in year one. Also, sorry. Then we'll look at the movement here. So if you look at year one and year two, it has increased by a thousand. So we'll have thousand here in that particular case. If you look at two and three, it has also increased by a thousand. So you go in there. And then year three and year four, it has also increased by a thousand. At the end, it will come as an inflow in the fourth year. So you realize that thousand, 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 thousand is going to be four thousand. So this is what you're going to be putting on the investment appraisal schedule. Year zero, negative thousand. So only the increase from the subsequent period is what you are going to be bringing in the schedule. Then at the end of the year or the end of the project life, all the outflows will come as an inflow at the end of the project. So if you talk about changing working capital in investment appraisal, this is how you deal with it. So only the increase is what will be handled. But then if you do it well, you realize that at the end of the year, the arithmetic total of those outflows will be the inflow at the end of the project. So protocol boy, that is how we deal with this particular issue when it comes to cash requirement, sorry, working capital requirement for projects. Yes, Josephine? Ishi. Yes? Please, so um, when you are doing consul and mm -hmm. you prepare your goodwill mm -hmm. and you have a negative um, goodwill, yeah. Um, how do you treat it in position and in performance? Right. So we said that negative goodwill is a gain on acquisition. Negative goodwill is gain on acquisition. So if it is gain on acquisition, gain is an income. So if you are preparing consolidated statement of profit or loss, that will be part of other income on the face of the financial performance. So it will be there. It could, it could either be under a part of other income or we'll bring it after gross profit as gain on acquisition. So it will be a line item on the face of the statement of profit or loss. If we are doing consolidated statement of financial position, then that will be part of group retained earnings. You add it to group retained earnings. In that case, there will not be any goodwill to be recognized on the face of the consolidated statement of financial position. Why? Because goodwill is negative, and that is a gain on goodwill. Does that make sense? That's it about that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Augustine, your hand is up. Yes, I say on the consolidation issue, the mm -hmm. uh, cost of capital, cost mm -hmm. of investment, the cost yeah. of investment, the item, and how you should calculate for them. Cost of you mean fair value of consideration transferred? Yes, sir. And then the company like. Okay, so uh, we mentioned the, that with a fair value cash. of consideration transferred, there are four components technically that we can have in that particular case. Number one, cash consideration. Definitely, that is not a miracle. If we paid physical cash for the deal, why not? That'll be part of the fair value of consideration transferred. But sometimes the company is broke. They can't pay it right now. So what would they do? They would do deferred consideration. They would do deferred consideration. Now, if they do deferred consideration, remember we have to apply IAS 37 because any deferred payment must be discounted into present terms using the cost of capital of the company. So if they are going to be making some payment a year from now, 
whatever payment they are going to be making must be discounted to present terms using the cost of capital of the parent entity. Please read the question well, because sometimes the examiner will just give you the present value, then you don't need any discounting again. But if the examiner gives you the value or the amount to be paid in the future, then you have to discount it into present terms using the uh, cost of capital of the parent entity. Now, that present value is what you are bringing here as part of fair value of consideration transferred. But if you remember under IAS 37, anytime you calculate fair value, you must calculate finance cost on that. So we need to calculate finance cost and that will be equal to the present value multiplied by the cost of capital of the company. And that finance cost, if we are preparing consolidated statement of profit or loss, it will be added to finance cost. Okay, it will be added to finance cost. If you are preparing consolidated statement of financial position, then that will be deducted from group retained earnings. You subtract it because finance cost is an expense. So it will be deducted from group retained earnings. Then on the face of the statement of financial position, we are going to be having deferred consideration. And that deferred consideration will be the present value plus the finance cost that you calculated. And that is IAS 37, and that is deferred consideration. So we don't have money now, so we give you some money in the future. That is deferred consideration. But with deferred consideration, there is another concept of that, and that is contingent consideration. Contingent consideration is where the entity, the parent entity, promised to make payment if the subsidiary entity meets a certain performance indicator during or after the post-acquisition period, okay? Or in the post-acquisition period. So for instance, hey, listen, a year from now, we're gonna give you 10 milli in addition to whatever money we've paid, but we will only pay the 10 milli if you are able to have revenue of $100 million. So that is called contingent consideration. In that case, whatever amounts they are gonna be paying will be coming here just the same way as the deferred consideration. Then if at the reporting date, listen carefully, the subsidiary is not able to meet the key performance indicator. What it means is that there is going to be a reduction in the amount to be paid. And reduction in contingent consideration is an income. So you recognize it as income if you are dealing with consolidated p &L, or you add it to group retained earnings, if you're dealing with consolidated statement of financial position, then on the face of the consolidated financial position, you bring the new figure that they will pay because of the inability of the subsidiary to meet the criteria. So that is the issue relating to, you know, contingent consideration. That one is a done deal. That's what we're going to pay. The only time it will change is they are not able to meet the criteria we set for them. So if they don't meet the criteria we set for them, then certainly we are not going to pay the full amount. Hence, any reduction in the contingent consideration becomes an income for us. It can't go up because we, it is fixed. Either we give you 10 million when you have 100 million sales. So if they don't get 100 million sales, the parent entity will say, right now I'll pay you just 2 million. That means we've saved ourselves 8 million. And that's an income. Reduction in provisions is an income for the entity. And so it has to be treated as an income. At a time, the entity will say, hey, listen, we don't have time to pay you any money. You guys must have continuing interest. So they will issue loan notes. Issue of loan notes. If they issue loan notes, we will do the calculation pertaining to loan notes, whatever it is. Then it will calculate the we will calculate finance cost on the loan notes. And just like how we presented here, if you are doing p &L, it will be added to finance cost. If you are doing position, it will be on the deducted from group retained earnings. Then when we go to the statement of financial position, the loan notes will be brought and that will be the value that you got in your fair value of consideration transfer plus the finance cost. So the loan notes must be recognized on the face of the statement of financial position inclusive of the finance cost you calculated on it, on the face of the consolidated statement of financial position. Then finally, issue of shares. 
sometimes the parent entity will issue shares in exchange of the shares that they have acquired. So we will do workings for that as well in that particular case. Two things you must understand. If the entity has already recorded the issue of shares, no problem. Then just get your value, calculate your goodwill and go away. But if in the question they said the entity has not recorded the issue of shares yet, then that means that the, issue, the value you got for the issue of shares must be splitted between share capital and share premium. Share capital and share premium. How do you do that? The amount that goes to the share capital will be the nominal value of the shares, and that will always be on the face of the statement of financial position. Then the amount that goes to the share premium is the quote or unquote the profit from the issue. So for instance, if the share exchange was done at a price of $2.5 per share and the nominal value of the shares of the company is 0 0.5, then 0 0.5 times the shares that we issued will go to the share capital. Then the profit here will be $2 because that is the 2.5 minus the 0 0.5 that is the profit from the issue of shares and certainly that will be recognized in share premium you do this split if categorically the question states that they have not recorded the issue of shares but if the question is quiet you can assume it is already recorded and go away or if they say it is recorded then you don't do this split you don't do this workings in that regard so if you ask about the fair value of consideration transferred, transferred and uh, their treatment, these are the things that you need to understand there. Let me know if that makes sense for you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. Please throw a light on fair value adjustment in consolidation, in consolidated financial statement. Fair value adjustment, it, it's a broad issue. It, it is based on the scenario we have available to know the fair value adjustment that we are going to do. It is based on the scenario. However, if, for instance, we are told that, oh, at the date of acquisition, now the reason why there is fair value adjustment is that after the parent is acquired, all the assets of the subsidiary must be revalued to fair value. So, if the question says, oh, at the date of acquisition, all assets are equal to their fair value, with the exception of plants, that has a fair value of 2,000 in excess of the carrying amount. What does that mean? In excess of the carrying amount or above the carrying amount. What does that mean? It means that the subsidiary had understated its assets. So in our net asset schedule, we'll bring that plant and add 2,000 at the date of acquisition, add 2,000 at the reporting date. Fair value in excess, which means the fair value is greater than the carrying value. Now, there is no rule for this. So you have to listen to the language very well. You have to listen to the language very well. Because when I flip this statement up and I say carrying value of 2000 in excess of fair value, then the story has changed. When I say carrying value is 2000 in excess of the fair value, that means in the second scenario, the carrying value is greater than the fair value, which means they are overstating their asset. So in that case, in my net asset schedule, I will subtract the 2000. So it is always important for you to read the blueprint to know it's the carrying amount greater than the fair value or the fair value greater than the carrying value. That's how you know whether you are supposed to add, they have understated, so you add, or you're supposed to subtract because they have overstated their assets. Then certainly there has to be, if it is a depreciable asset, then you have to calculate some post-acquisition, you know, depreciation and deal with it in the net asset schedule. If they had understated their assets, in the first scenario that we did, which you added, then what will happen is that it means they had also understated their depreciation for the year. So we calculate additional depreciation for the post-acquisition period and come and subtract it uh, in that particular case. 
But if they have overstated their assets because the carrying amount is greater than the fair value, that means they have also overstated their depreciations. In that case, the post-acquisition depreciation will be added back because remember you deducted the overstatement. So you will add back the depreciation in that particular case. Then finally, if the subsidiary had not incorporated, you have to read this carefully in the question. If the subsidiary had not incorporated these fair value changes in its financial statement, then the effect of the depreciation and then the initial amounts will be recognized on the face of the statement of financial position. So when you go to statement of financial position and you write property plans and equipment, you bring the parent figure, you bring the subsidiaries figure, then you have to bring the fair value adjustment effect here. And that's how you get a consolidated financial statement results. So if you ask about fair value, what I would say is that it depends on the scenario that you have available, but you have to read the scenarios and find out that based on the scenario, has the entity understated its assets? If they have understated their assets, we're going to be adding it. If they have overstated their assets, we're going to be subtracting. In that regard, if it is a liability and they have not incorporate, note that liability reduces the net asset. So if there is any liability that they have not incorporated in the accounts, then we are going to bring it up and it will be deducted. So I don't know if you remember the question we solved in class. There was a deferred tax uh, issue. You realize that we deducted it from the date of acquisition and the date of the reporting date. Why? because deferred tax is a liability and it reduces the net assets available. So that is what I would say there. It depends on the scenario, the context that is available, but your key way out is being solid in the accounting standards. Fair value adjustment is about the IASs or the IFRSs. The examiner can throw whatever the heck he likes there. So once you are solid on your accounting standard, because there can be IAS 36 there, uh, sorry, IAS 38, intangible assets. There can be issues about IAS 12, income tax. There can be issues about IAS 16, property, plant, and equipment in the fair value measurement. There can be issues about IAS 20, sorry, 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, contingent assets. There can be issues even about IAS 23, borrowing cost. Maybe the subsidiary has incurred some borrowing cost and it meets the criteria for IAS 23 capitalization, but they hadn't capitalized it yet. So right now we have to bring that back into the books and then calculate depreciation on it. So it's about understanding of the accounting standards and that is how you can excel in the fair value adjustment in that case. So the fair value adjustment will center around these standards, 38, 37, 23, 12, and 16. And once you are solid on these standards, you can then make, you can then look at the mistakes that a company has made and then bring out the issue about the correct thing that must be done. Remember everything here will usually be relating to the subsidiary. Hence, it will be in your net asset schedule and the respective adjustment will be done there. Okay, you're welcome. Yes, uh, Augustine, your hand is up. Yes, sir. So I want you to throw more light on the non-controlling interest, the two methods used to calculate the non-controlling interest. Now, we established that when it comes to non-controlling interest, there are two ways that it could be calculated. The way non-controlling interest is calculated affects um, how goodwill is shared. Now, we can use, we can calculate non-controlling interest at fair value, or we calculate non-controlling interest using the proportionate method. The proportionate method is where the non-controlling interest is going to be the percentage of ownership multiplied by the net assets of the company. So you are just valuing them using their percentage of ownership of the net assets of the company. That is the proportionate method. But in the fair value, two things can happen. Either it is valued at fair value as per the directors of the parents. So that one is to be given to you directly. You don't have to do calculation. So they will say that at the date of acquisition, the directors of the parents have decided that fair value of NCI is whatever. $10,000. If that's the case, you use that figure, you go away. 
But at other times, NCI can be valued at fair value using the, the number of shares that they own in the subsidiary. So in that case, the fair value will become the number of shares that the subsidiary own, that the NCI owns in the subsidiary, multiplied by the share price of the shares in the subsidiary. In that case, in this case, you would have to calculate this, but the information will be provided to you for you to do the calculation. Now, why is this important? Because of goodwill allocate impairment in goodwill. If there is impairment in goodwill and NCI is valued using the proportionate method, then the impairment will be borne solely by the parent entity because you are using proportionate method. But if uh, NCI is valued at fair value, then impairment in goodwill will be shared between the NCI and the parent using their percentage of ownership in that case. So that is how NCI is valued and the implication of that on the determination of the allocation of impairment in goodwill. So that is the issue about that. Um, Augustine, let me know if that makes sense there. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Right. Okay. Um, just when your hand is up, what you got? You sure? Yeah. Please, um, um, console again. When, um, in the trial balance, in, mm -hmm. in the, uh, position, it's a stated that the subsidiary is paying dividend. Uh -huh. to, it's paying dividend and the dividend is going to the uh, parents. Uh -huh. How do you treat it? If subsidiary has paid dividend, then it's supposed to be on the, it's supposed to be on the face of the consolidated financial statement. So probably they will include it in their other income. So if you are doing P&L, that may be recognized in other income. Because if you are preparing statement of financial position, it is share of profit that goes to group retained earnings. Share of profit that goes to group retained earnings. So any dividend that they receive from the associate, sorry, from the parent would then have to be deducted. So if whilst you are adding share of profit to the group retained earnings, if they receive any dividend during the year, it will be deducted. So that's how you treat it. It will be included in the other income on the in the profit or loss. Then if you are doing position, because you will bring share of profit, share of post acquisition profit as an addition to the group retained earnings, then any dividend they received also must be deducted so that we will now know the net figure that we will actually add and recognize in group retained earnings. Does that make sense? Yes, but um, there is this question nice so uh, the solution they did was um, they took a percentage of the parents uh -huh. and put it in um, the group retained earnings yeah i don't know if it's making sense now that means they took they didn't say um dividend paid to the parents they said total dividend paid by the subsidiary yes if that yes so if that is the statement total dividend paid then we will just take our share of the parents because that means part was paid to the NCI. So we will just take our portion of it and that is what we will bring to the group retained earnings. So if the subsidiary paid a total dividend of X amount, then we will just take our portion of it for consolidation purposes because the rest went to the NCI. Thank you. Okay. So that is the issue about that um, in that case. And uh, maybe we're going to end around here. Uh, and uh, myself, I have to sleep. I have a class around 4 a.m. today. And uh, so we're going to end here today, basically, for the discussion. And uh, we hope that we were able to provide you with some understanding on this. Uh, today is what? Saturday, right? Tomorrow we'll have another session like that. So if there are any other issues, go into your notes and then you can bring them up tomorrow uh, during our discussion. Then um, Sunday evening, 
we're going to be having another Q and A session, and we're going to be focusing on corporate reporting, financial reporting, so that we deal with some challenges you have before you go to the exam hall on Monday. Monday evening we will meet for the Tuesday paper. Tuesday evening we will meet for the Wednesday's paper. I'm hoping we can do that because uh, by the time you start the exams, I am also enjoying greater works. So I'm hoping I'll be able to close from greater works, reach home on time, and have a session. I don't know. So it depends. I'll see what we can do if it is possible because I got to be at Greater Works. All right. You are invited to Greater Works. Just that you can't come because you will be writing exams. So we will pray for you. And Amen. <laughs> so that's it about that. And um, I will end here today. Tomorrow we will come again and uh, let's see how we can have some of these discussions and uh, how we can assist you better in that case. So have a great night.